This episode of Good Investing Talks is supported by Interactive Brokers. If you're ever looking for a broker, Interactive Brokers is the place to go. I personally use their service because I think they have a great selection of stocks and markets you can access. They have super fair prices and a great tracking system to track your performance. If you want to try out the offer of Interactive Brokers and support my channel, please click on the link below. There you will be directed to Interactive Brokers and can get an idea what they offer for you. I really like their tool and it's a high recommendation by me. And now enjoy the video. The audience of Good Investing Talk, it's great to have you back. Today I'm having an American who has a firm that's named Latin, Kuwaitis Capital, and he lives in Paris. It's great to have you here, John. Thanks for having me. Um, you have an interesting background uh, in investing, and today we are mostly focusing on your like core expertise. It's restaurants and the retail industry, which you're covering from the value investing perspective. Um, what has brought you to this kind of setup, and why are you in Paris as American? Okay, so um, just a little bit of background about me. Uh, I was actually born in Germany, which you probably didn't know. Uh, and grew up in a small town in, in Wisconsin, uh, attended some university in England. Uh, I lived in the Czech Republic, and then um, I married a French girl. So that eventually brought me to, to Paris. So I've always been pretty internationally uh, oriented as far as my uh, interests from a cultural and kind of lifestyle standpoint. Uh, looking back at investing and value investing. Uh, originally, I was a philosophy PhD student, which is probably also not what you normally hear, uh, moved to New York to pursue a PhD in philosophy, but quickly found that was an untenable career choice and went directly into finance. Um, from there, I started in equity research. And over time, I've graduated towards the value investing species with a focus on the consumer uh, particularly retail and restaurants. So I'm following some US companies, some Canadian companies, some Chinese companies, and I try to get on the road quite a bit uh, to see the businesses, meet with the management teams, uh, as well as do my, my modeling, et cetera, from here and talking to clients uh, with clients in um, the US, uh, UK, Australia, different places around the world. So why did you decide to go for retail and restaurants? Um, as your focus of analysis? Um, well, retail was a little bit of an accident. So when I got my first job uh, as an analyst, which is at a firm called Sedodian Company, uh, they kind of just gave me a retail business to analyze um, a small retailer called Piercing Pagoda, which sold jewelry and kiosks, now part of Zale Corp. Um, but it turns out that that was a really good area for me because it combined kind of, if you will, left brain and right brain approach I was a little bit more on the um, qualitative side in terms of my thinking and how I approach life in general versus a pure analytic sort of person. So combining those two things happened to be um, pretty appropriate to my way of thinking and, and something that I found interesting and enjoyed. Uh, for the restaurants, that came out of a more technical approach that I developed to looking at retailers which was focused on uh, unit level economics. So over probably 15 years, maybe longer, I've, I've developed an approach to breaking retailers down into their component parts and analyzing them um, at the unit level. And I have an entire approach that uh, uses this as a basis for forecasting. And what I discovered is I'm kind of agnostic about what is sold in the box. And so it can be any kind of retailer. And realistically, restaurants have the same financial structure of a corporate headquarters, some expenses that can be leveraged. And then the economic, the value, of, the engine of economic value creation is the individual box. And so I've been able to take that uh, retail uh, discipline, which I developed, and apply to this other area. It also works in different things. For example, fitness gyms, um, anything where there's a, a lot of individual units uh, that can be analyzed for their return properties. 
The US consumer plays a super important role to understand the dynamics in retail and restaurants. So how do you keep up to date on the US consumer? What are key metrics here you are tracking? What can you share with us? When I look at the US consumer, the number one thing that we look at is first on, is employment. And so generally the idea is that if consumers are employed, they're going to keep spending. Um, so, and as you know, U.S. consumer spending is two thirds of the of the economy uh, domestically in the U.S. Um, within, aside from that, the next things we look at are um, access to capital. So we look to see if borrowing costs are going up or down, um, if banks' willingness to lend is changing. Um, we look at um, uh, the um, expense trends that the consumer might have. That's obviously a very important topic today. Uh, we look at oil prices and gas prices in particular, um, which historically have been volatile. Uh, and then we look at the housing market um, as that's a big driver of consumer activity. We look at the stock market um, that can impact the higher income consumers uh, spending activities. Um, and then consumer confidence, I find that a little bit more of a lagging indicator. I actually think retail sales are a better measurement of consumer confidence than is consumer confidence, um, as it's stated. Um, and one other thing that can affect the consumer that we pay attention to are is the media. So we look in particular for political uh, news can be disruptive and change what consumers are doing from a behavior standpoint. Um, but realistically, the main thing is employment, um, followed by some expenses. And then um, beyond that, we'll look at some psychographic trends uh, and secular trends that are causing consumers to change what they're doing or their behavior or their values. But th those are a few of the things that we start with. Also, uh, I spend my time, I try to talk to a lot of different companies. I'm talking to companies um, every week, consumer companies. And so when I speak with them, I ask them what they are hearing from their consumers, what kind of behavior is going on, um, what concerns there are. Some of the businesses that I follow, namely Walmart, um, specifically conduct their own consumer confidence surveys and, fre and frequently they are willing to share some details that they get there. And so all of these things kind of come together to create a mosaic, if you will, uh, for a view of like how the consumer is feeling right now. And then, of course, you know, as investors, we're looking into the future. So we're thinking about how the consumer might be changing six, nine, 18 months into the future and what the implications might be for uh, the financial results of the companies that we follow. Why are you a bit skeptical with the consumer confidence measures? Um, I don't think they're that great. Um, so there are two consumer confidence measures that people look at. There's the University of Michigan and then there's the conference board. Um, and oftentimes what you'll find in the media is they will cite consumer confidence uh, from those two sources to either be positive or negative about things that are going to happen in the future with the economy. But what happens, in my view, is that those um, surveys capture short term sentiment changes in the consumer, but that doesn't necessarily correlate with what they actually do with their with their financial with their money. So they may feel uncertain, but continue to spend um, as if nothing had really changed. And so that's why I think retail sales is a better measurement. So when you see retail sales go down, that tells you the consumer is pulling back and they don't necessarily line up with the, with the surveys. Where do you see changes happening in the like consumer taste preferences in the restaurants and retail spaces? What big trends or what micro trends shape the space? Well, right now, everything is still the after effects of COVID. Those, those are the biggest identifiable secular shifts in behavior. Um, so, for example, uh, you also have some demographic shifts. So you have consumers moving from urban areas to uh, suburban or rural areas. Uh, we might call that rural revitalization. Um, you have more interest in health and well-being because there was a very strong correlation between um, negative outcomes with COVID and personal health scenarios. So there's a kind of an amplified interest 
in remaining healthy and activities around that. Um, there has been some change in travel. The, these, these kind of are continue to develop. So initially, no one travel, and now there's an explosion of travel demand, but there are also people that are uh, still avoiding air, 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 airplanes and airports. And so they're buying RVs or traveling within, domestically within the U.S. and their automobiles. Um, those are a few of the, the trends. Um, and then from a secular standpoint right now, we are more of an economic standpoint. You have a divergence in spending based on income group. So the lower quintile income group in particular is under a lot of pressure based on inflationary changes. And so that income group is, is pulling back from discretionary spending. Other higher income groups seem to kind of be continuing in the same vein as before and absorbing the higher costs. Um, so we're paying attention to that as well. And, um, you know, there's still some question about whether you'll get what's called reversion in some of these categories that it's seen a significant pickup in sales. For example, the sporting goods category is still significantly higher than it was pre-COVID from a sales productivity standpoint. Is that going to revert back to the pre-levels or is that going to stay at a higher levels of sales and consumer demand uh, because of secular change? So these are some of the debates that are out there and, you know, some of them People lean one way or another. Stock prices may be reflecting one dominant view. We may or may not have that view. Uh, and then we're looking for um, data points to support whichever outcome we think is going to happen. Being a few years into this kind of research field, are there any spaces or taste preferences where you are still surprised that they are that stable? Uh, well, there's a lot of debate about change and... Uh, Adaption. So, so two two examples. Uh, so, I mentioned sporting goods, right? Another example. Uh, so, I follow this company called Tractor Supply, uh, and they sell to what's called the the hobby farmer. So, you have to kind of it, this might be a little bit challenging to get your your mind around. Uh, even I grew up in a rural area, and I didn't really understand what this was. Uh, which is the, they're talking about people who have a couple of acres. They may grow a, some um, crops, but it's but it's not their kind of they're not a, it's not professional farmers. It's people who maybe have a few horses and have chickens. I know it sounds kind of unusual, but they this group um, of these homesteaders um, uh, have there's been an influx of people into this lifestyle, uh, which is also very independent and self sufficient. Um, it tends to be, obviously it's more rural, but not it's, they were less impacted by COVID and social distancing because these, they were already distanced before all of this happened. Um, and so the sales in these categories have gone up quite considerably. Uh, there's also a strong correlation, uh, with this group of individuals and pet ownership. So pet ownership went up a lot during the pandemic. Uh, a lot of people adopted, Uh, dogs uh, because, you know, they felt lonely, they needed companionship. And so these pets continue to be around. And so pet sales are still elevated relative to the pandemic. So there's some question, you know, does that tail off over time? Is this a permanent shift? Are, are these changes um, going to last for a long time? Um, you know, did, and then you had also in the U.S. complicating it, Uh, the distribution of all these funds and you had a pent up period where people didn't spend money. And then now they, over the last year, or 18 months have, uh, have gone out and spent on things that they didn't buy during the pandemic. Is that the new level of spending or has that been elevated and is somehow, you know, ethereal and it's going to tail off a different example, just to add one more to the mix is the beauty category. So during um, the pandemic, you know, there was still some need to, for, to wear makeup, maybe a little bit less, uh, but you still wanted to look good, I guess, on your Zoom call. And, you, and the uh, self-care component of beauty also continued to do well as part of the health and wellness focus. But one category that did not sell so well during the pandemic was fragrances. So you don't really need to smell that good um, on your Zoom call. But now that the economy has opened up again, there's been a, a, a big resurgence of fragrance sales. And so the beauty business is seeing more people spend on a kind of 
feel good, treat yourself, uh, you only live once sort of approach. In addition, they're spending on fragrances, which tend to be a high price tag and a very high margin. And so you're seeing, uh, for example, Ulta Beauty uh, just reported fantastic sales, uh, perhaps the highest quarterly sales and profit in the company's history on the back of this surge in spending in this category. So in my mind, the question is, is this a one-time makeup, of makeup, not to use a pun there, but one-time uh, recovery of past spending that didn't happen? Or is this a new, plat a new higher level of spending that's going to be sustained? Two interesting questions. You have this also interesting state that you're living in Europe and you have this focus on the US. Um, it's quite interesting to use these two lenses because there are some concepts, for instance, Walmart, they did try to expand to Germany. They, they failed. So are there any, any concepts that are quite unique to the US market and that won't transfer to other geographies that easily? So the biggest thing when understanding the two markets from a consumer standpoint, in, in my opinion, is dependence on the automobile. So the outside of a few select large urban markets in the U.S., literally everyone is driving. And this is goes up and down the income spectrum. Um, sometimes uh, my clients would think that lower income consumers in rural areas didn't have cars. But having grown up in a rural area myself, I know that you can't get to your job if you don't have a car. People don't live close to wherever their, their employment might have been. So it's really a necessity. You, you just can't function as a family without a car. And so the retail um, approach uh, for consumers in the U.S. almost always involves access via a vehicle. Um, and when we look at Europe, I just don't think that is the same. I think people are much more concentrated. You have better public transportation. Um, you have fewer stores that are built on the periphery of um, towns. You have um, longer uh, geographies that weren't originally designed around automobiles. And so it's just not as convenient to build all of these um, inexpensive, cheap boxes on the exterior of population centers because people in cities wouldn't go to them in Europe. Uh, so with that as a backdrop, um, for example, one of the sectors I follow is called the dollar stores. Now, some of them sell things only at $1, but many of them sell things at prices higher than that. And the idea is just that they are inexpensive um, sellers of consumables um, to consumers in a low maintenance, uh, inexpensively constructed store, uh, typically either in rural markets or in urban markets. Um, so they're situated where they don't have to compete with Walmart or they, um, they um, are close to where people, their customer lives. And so I don't think that that concept would translate as well um, to most European markets. There was a company, I believe it went private in the UK called Poundland, um, which is a very, you know, cheeky uh, change from dollar store. Um, and I don't think that there is anything of that nature um, that I'm aware of in France. Um, another thing that's happening right now in the US, which is worth mentioning and in the same theme, is drive throughs uh, for um, food and restaurant concepts. And so Starbucks, for example, is transforming its store base from the sit-down cafes that originally made it so successful and popular into a drive through format. It's trying to to put more of its stores into, into drive throughs And that's driven by two factors. One, technology. So you can use your app to uh, order in advance and you can customize on the app and you get all of your loyalty program, et cetera, data through the app, which enables um, more convenience of staying in your car and getting the product uh, correct, correctly made for you when you arrive. Um, Chipotle is also shifting from 
its more sit-down oriented store format to a drive-through format. There's a small company that just went public called um, Dutch Brothers, which sells um, coffee-like drinks, let's say, uh, all drive-through, 100% drive-through format. And um, I just, you know, people don't live in their cars in the same way in Europe. At least that's my perception from, from Paris. How unique um, are the markets in the US compared to Europe? Like if you compare the German and the French market, it, uh, it's apples and bananas you're comparing. But like, for instance, if you compare Omaha to California or to New York, how unique are these markets? Or is it like easily to roll out to 400 million consumers in the US? So that's a great question. And the answer is there are regional differences um, and it might depend a little bit on the category. Um, so for example, you know, I followed Foot Locker for a long time and Foot Locker has about a third of its stores here in Europe. And so they would tell me that the market in Italy is very different from the market in Germany. So what the Italian consumer wants to buy could be completely different shoes than what the German consumer is buying. Um, in the US, I don't think there is as broad of a chain. You do have kind of urban versus suburban. So you have certain customer groups that live in downtown areas that may be buying specific kinds of shoes that don't also sell in suburban markets. Um, from, that's a fashion comment. Um, for the restaurants, um, there are some concepts that just work in all markets. Like, you know, Starbucks seems to be not only working in all markets in the US, but they have 33,000 stores worldwide. Um, although they do adapt, they're not all selling the same product in every store, um, but the concept seems to translate quite well. Um, you can have differences in regional competition. Um, you can have some influences in some Southern states. You might get a, a different Hispanic population, which ha if you're a food retailer, you need to have specific products that cater to that customer's um, interests and needs. And those can be actually different because you have sometimes different groups of, of immigrants from South and Central America that have different tastes. So a food retailer might have to adapt to those kind of things. But in general, I think it's a fair bet to say that it's relatively homogenous and concepts that work in some places will work in other places from a consumer standpoint. What I've seen happen is that the expense structure can be different. Um, and so in particular, if you start in California and then move to the Midwest, um, they may not really understand who, who the customer is or the density of the stores, like how close together you can put them might have to be different. Um, And uh, I've seen uh, rent changes in rents uh, and customer tastes happen. So it's subtle. It's, they can exist. You can have problems, um, but it's not nearly as different as what you're describing between going to France and Germany, for example. Thinking a bit about the infrastructure retailer runs in, um, you mentioned the, the cheap boxes uh, already, which are part of this This, this retail game or this restaurant game, um, these cheap boxes depend on cheap energy to run, I think, because they they usually, maybe it's more a read question you don't cover, but I'm interested in this coming from this European external shock with energy prices. So you need cheap fuels to get to the store and the store has to be like to be cooled and to be warmed in winter. It has also like high energy costs And it's not like the highest billing quality if it's a cheap box or am I wrong here? Um, so there's a couple of things to dig into there. Um, so first, as I'm sure you know, energy costs at the consumer level are much higher in Europe than they are um, in the US. Um, just as an example, um, filling up my Jeep tank here in France was costing me 100 euros. And then uh, filling up the tank, I I had rented over the summer and a giant SUV for seven people cost me only $70 in the US. Um, and I'm pretty sure the tank in the US was much larger than the one in, in Europe. Um, I mean, I think most people are aware of that, but it's kind of, that was just my own personal example uh, recently. Um, the 
when I talk about the cheap box, so, so yes, you need the low gas prices so the customer can continue to get to the store. Uh, I think that's important. Um, but the, it's the build out of the box that, um, had tend to be inexpensive and then drove a very attractive financial model because, uh, for example, in the dollar stores, they would spend, I would say less than $250,000 to build the entire store. And these are probably 8,000 square foot stores. So in meters, that's like, um, 80 meters squared. Um, uh, so the 800 meters squared. And so the, so the build out cost is very low. Uh, like you couldn't build, you know, a, like much for that kind of price, but then you have very fast turnover of, of consumables with low inventory. So you're generating, um, a lot of cash through a box with not much initial build out. What's happening right now is that the cost to build all these stores is gone is going up. So the cost for steel is going up, cost for labor is going up, supply chain costs are going up. Um, so the economics um, for some of these concepts is less attractive. I think building costs in general tend to be more expensive uh, in Europe. Um, in the UK, you can't get five-year leases as easily, for example, as you can in the US. They tend to have 20-year leases. So you're signing up for a much longer commitment there. Um, I think the build-out costs and the regulations um, here tend to, in Europe tend to be longer and more onerous and more expensive. And so there's a little bit higher of a risk uh, threshold to get stores into these markets. But theoretically, you would also have less competition as a result of that. Who owns the stores or the land? Like, for instance, in Europe, it's quite fascinating that Aldi and Lidl, uh, as they expanded, they always bought the land and built the stores on them. So now they have like premium uh, land in some of the core cities in Europe. Okay, so that's going to depend on a, a retail by retail basis. In general, most public companies rent their or lease their properties, and they tend to be owned by all kinds of different investors. Um, sometimes they'll do build the suit and they do sale lease back. Um, in contrast, the big box retailers, Walmart, Target, Home Depot and Lowe's, for example, they all own their real estate and I believe Costco as well. And a lot of times investors forget about that. They forget about the real estate value of those of that significant investment. So your return on invested capital is going to be much lower because you're expending a much higher capital amount to acquire the acquire the box. Um, but on a risk adjusted basis uh, and on an expense structure basis, you could argue this is much more attractive because you're not exposed to higher rents. Um, and, um, you have an asset on underlying the business. So I think when, when you're analyzing these kind of companies, you need to take into account, um, the capital structure, uh, of the business's balance sheet, but also that, uh, that uh, approach that they use from a real estate perspective. And another comparison, I often was surprised when I saw it was the comparison of square meters available for malls and shopping concepts in Europe and the U S it's still that like that U S has so much, uh, square meters and malls available. So I haven't looked at that recently, but, uh, if what you're alluding to is the report that there's some enormously larger square, square meters per capita in the U S versus the rest of the world. Yeah. We're, you know, I'm aware of that. Like, so Canada, which is maybe more similar from just a, psychographic demographic perspectives of the US, they have much less retail square footage per capita. So in general, in Canada, you, you'll see higher sales productivity and higher rents um, because there's less space available. Um, the US, it's widely believed, has been significantly overbuilt from a, especially the malls uh, standpoint. Now, the last time I really looked at this was maybe 10 years ago. And at that point, everyone was point was um, focused on the fact that Amazon was a much more uh, 
convenient and better solution and that all of these malls didn't really have a, a reason to exist. And since then, a lot of like the weakest malls have disappeared or been converted into other space. And there is a lot of what I guess call zombie malls uh, where they just, you know, they I guess they still exist, but they're they're not really that um, visit well visited by the population. There's generally what's considered to be uh, what's called an A mall. Uh, and there are around 300 of these in the U.S. And you can be an A mall by being uh, uh, surrounded by a very high income demographic, or you can be an A mall by being surrounded by a very dense population. So the sales productivity in the malls tends to be really, really good. And these malls um, continue to do quite well, um, despite the general shift or the share shift to online shopping. Another thing when you think about the infrastructure and the stores is the inventory they have. And then through the last years, we had this problems with inventories and this, this volatility um, that companies had to order a lot and they now have to be too big inventories. Like, do you think there's something structurally changing in the future, especially uh, as a lot of the production happens in China for the US? Um, or, yeah. So it's a, it's a good question. Um, the com companies are trying to address this supply chain volatility. Um, many of them have been caught and part of that with too much goods. And part of that is not understanding the extent to which Uh, business was distorted by uh, transfer payments, stimulus checks in a post-pandemic recovery where consumers also had pent up spending ability from you know, being stuck inside. So this uh, augmented or inflated demand at the time, uh, retailers didn't have enough goods. So then and it was taking too much longer because of ripple effects of COVID impacting production in the Far East and also the ability to get product off of the ports. Uh, and there weren't even enough truckers. I mean, there was it was there was a there was an issue at every moment in the supply chain um, getting the product into the stores. So as a result, retailers ordered more and they ordered earlier. And so then when demand slowed down because of inflation eating into discretionary spending ability and fewer uh, stimulus checks, they were left with too many goods. And so that's what you saw, particularly at Target and Walmart. Um, other retailers have also faced that. But it has been concentrated in retailers that uh, service the lower income consumer um, and I believe that these retailers will work through the inventory. Kind of the history of like inventory bubbles uh, within retailers suggests that they, if they take the strong actions to clear those goods out, that margins will return to some normal level at, at some point in the future. Usually, you want to buy a retailer when they blow, you know, and they have real problems around inventory because they're it's a fixable issue. Uh, but the second part of your question, just to continue, is if things are going to change in the future. And I think that's an interesting question because um, there's also a heightened political tension, if we put it in those terms, uh, between um, the U.S. and some of its trading partners. And there's a kind of a movement to use this as an excuse to try to bring the supply chain closer to home. One element of getting products from the Fort Far East is that this has been a deflationary uh, influence over 20, 25 years. And so it's helped the uh, government to keep interest rates low over this very long time period. So if that if we're at the end of that multi-decade cycle of offshoring production to lower cost uh, countries, and we're now bringing that product or that production back, that's going to make it more difficult to bring down inflation, in my opinion. Now, this might be a little bit above my level of qualification to talk about, but 
Um, I think that's within some uh, of the considerations that companies are using when they think about if they want to change their supply chains um, kind of on a permanent basis to be closer to home. And um, for now, I think most retailers are going to stick with their Far East suppliers, but that could change. Yeah, there's a general topic also of the question if there's enough labor, cheap labor to keep the costs so low, because uh, in Europe, I think in Germany, in the next five years or 10 years, 15, 13 million people will retire. Uh, so there's a question <laughs> to find enough laborers. And also in China, if you think about there are 1 billion in, inhabitants or 1.2, 1.4, depends on who you quote. And there are only 10 million childs. So it's uh, or children every year born. So it's, a, it's an interesting question to also think about this consequence. It's definitely not positive to have a um, shrinking population or an aging population. Uh, the U.S. has historically benefited from immigration. So even though perhaps, I don't have the numbers on this, but perhaps the higher income, more educated population has fewer children, uh, but it, the overall population of the U.S. has been augmented through um, through emigration. And many European countries don't have that same kind of component boast, uh, boosting up their, their demographics and the, the younger uh, worker base that they need to be paying in taxes and, and producing things so that, you know, the other people can retire and the economy can continue to grow. So those demographic influences are important. I think that's important from an investment standpoint also to know that there are enough, there's enough demand to create you know, GDP growth in the market. But now let's circle back to the restaurant and the, the retail sector. If you think about the sector and companies you've studied, uh, what could go wrong uh, in the sector? Like how and why do companies fail or be a really bad investment? Okay, there's, there's, a, lot, there's a lot there to, to, to approach. Um, you know, the, the most obvious one is change in, in competition. Right. And so and failure to invest uh, and stay up to date with what's happening with the consumer. So, I mean, the biggest killer of retail businesses over the last 15 years has been Amazon. So you had businesses that were late to understand that the consumer was shifting to shop online. They didn't invest in having their own um, solution from an omnichannel standpoint. Uh, and they, they may have been selling um, product produced by others. So they didn't own the, the product from a vertical supply chain standpoint. And so they just got priced out and they had nothing really that they were bringing to the, to the table. Um, you can have, um, from an investment standpoint, businesses that, yeah. So, I mean, so investing in the business, I think, is one of the most important things to look at. So another good example um, that, maybe isn't discussed as much anymore is, is Sears Kmart. So if we compare Sears Kmart to Walmart and Target, Sears Kmart has gone bankrupt and is disappearing and there's only a few of them left, but it used to be um, one of the biggest retailers in the United States uh, before Eddie Lampert acquired it and combined the two and then basically used it to sell off assets um, and, you know, and um, um, you know, benefit from that while he ran the company into the ground. Uh, so that's an example of their just deferred maintenance. They didn't keep the stores up to, be, to date. They didn't invest in a, a true e-commerce solution, and they were just run over um, by the competition um, between Walmart, Target, and uh, Amazon, amongst others. In the fashion space, you can always get the fashion wrong. And so that's a big risk on any of these either teen-based retailers or uh, even if you wanted to look at Lululemon or Nike or Adidas, you know, if they were to be on the wrong side of fashion for too long, you would lose sales and market share and you would definitely not do well owning the stock during that period. That's pretty hard. There's not that many companies that can consistently deliver attractive assortments that their customer wants and anticipate where their customer is going on a season in season out basis on a multi over multi many years and in different markets. Lululemon has been incredibly good at it. 
Um, and you know, Nike is also, I think, one of the the most exceptional companies uh, in the world. Um, other things that screw up retailers are, you know, expanding too fast, bad execution. Um, there's a, there's a host of ways you can get killed owning retail stocks. What what could go wrong with restaurants? So restaurants um, restaurants are a little bit more volatile uh, because they tend to well they're first of all they're more economic they're more cyclical, right? So you know historically you save money by eating at home. So in times that things uh, get more difficult for the consumer, restaurant stocks just underperform. And we've seen that so far this year. Uh, they're also exposed to commodity price pressures more. So beef costs, wheat costs, um, chicken, corn, all of these commodity costs are up dramatically, uh, partially because of what's happening in the U.S., but also what's happening in Ukraine. Um, and that is impacting the margins that these businesses report. Um, so that hasn't been great for them. Uh, there's also uh, consumer trends within within restaurants and food. There are certain things that people want to eat. They move away from. Um, you can have temporary situations like uh, you may recall the Chipotle E. coli outbreak, which um, crushed the sales and business for some time, turned out to be a wonderful buying opportunity because they were able to bounce back and then bring in really excellent management since then. Um, but if, you know, if you're you know, not anticipating that, you can certainly get hurt. Um, and then there's, there's changes in, um, as I mentioned, consumer behavior. So let's, you mentioned Cheesecake Factory earlier. Um, I think that that concept tends to appeal to an older customer and it needs to be reinvented to appeal to the millennials and the Gen Zs. And if they can't find a way to translate that concept to that younger customer, I think it's going to be challenging for them to remain relevant over the long term. So there's all these different things that are happening. Um, Brinker, which uh, Brinker International, which operates Chili's, has a lower income consumer. They seem to be under pressure uh, because their business was typically driven by promotions. And now, due to the commodity price pressures and labor price pressures, they feel that they can't really uh, offer the same level of promotions and, and obtain a uh, reasonable margin. So they're trying to pull back on promotional activity within their stores. Don't know if that's going to work. Uh, and then lastly, I'll mention this before I turn it back over to you. Right now in the U.S., there is a coordinated increase of prices at restaurants in a way that I have never seen before. So for example, uh, Cheesecake Factory, which I spoke to last week, is raising its prices about 7.5% compared to last year. Chipotle's average price in the second half of the year will be 13% higher than last year, which in turn was 10% higher than the year before. Both companies say that prices at grocery stores have gone up even more. And so therefore, on a relative basis, they're still providing value to the consumer and it's going to be fine and okay. And the customer is not going to push back. But my feeling is that if you raise your prices too much the and the consumer starts to no longer believe that your product offering presents a value, it will be very, very difficult to get that perception back. And so I think these businesses or the industry in general is running this risk right now. And I don't think that this is going, my, my personal sense is that this is not going to turn out well. It's definitely a challenge uh, um, with this kind of high price races, but we will see how it plays out in the future. Um, If you think about restaurants, there's this, this I would call it a bit holy grail for investors, the idea of franchises, because you just license out uh, your brand or your concept and you earn royalties from it. Um, but with this, it also goes hand in hand with the question how you can keep up quality with your concept and give this kind of like good or superior restaurant experience. What is your experience around this Franchise concepts and also the general questions, how restaurants, if they scale, how they could execute on a high level and still offer a lot of value for the customers. 
Okay, so I've just, I recently just did um, a lot of work around franchising and looking at different concepts. Uh, and I looked at it from a financial standpoint more than an operational standpoint. So let me talk a little bit about the financial com uh, perspective first, and then I'll address the meat of your question, which is more around the operational execution side of it. Um, you know, first off, yes, it, you're absolutely right that um, being a franchisor, uh, is a very attractive business model, right? So you get a, your franchisee to put their capital into the business and you take a royalty off of the revenues. And in a inflationary environment, I think this is a, is a very interesting sector to be looking at because um, as the franchisor, you benefit from inflation that is the price is going up because you're, you're taking a, a royalty off the top line, but you don't own the labor. Like your franchisee partner has the, has the labor costs that they have to deal with or so the commodity costs. So the franchisor theoretically can benefit from this, you know, within reason um, without being exposed to the downside. Now, my personal experience owning uh, some of the franchise stocks I own, they've done okay, I wouldn't say they've been doing amazingly in 2022. Um, but um, that, that's point number one. Uh, point number two, um, the return on invested capital, uh, when you look at it, does count for the franchisee. So you want to see that your franchisee partner is able to generate uh, attractive cash flows at their box, and because that's what drive that's your engine of growth there. You need your franchisee to be generating good returns and cash so they can open up more stores. And that's what uh, creates incremental value for you as the, the parent company. Um, and then to get to your question around operations, um, that I mean, that's that's a little bit trickier. I don't know if I have a good answer for you. I think I think the reality is that if you're going to be a franchisor, you need to have a team. You need quality inspectors. You need to have guys out there in the field. You need to bring in your franchisees uh, on um, a fairly regular basis so that everybody is on the same page um, in terms of how the stores need to look, the standards, the products. Um, and th those that is actually there is a you know serious execution risk if you try to move too fast or you sign up the wrong people as franchisees. So. Um, most of the big public companies I've dealt with, I've never really seen a, a problem w from that perspective, but I imagine that there are problems for sure. And um, it's a good question how they manage it. But I think the answer is with lots of people and um, inspections and meetings. Do you notice a movie about the f founders of McDonald's? and the I saw one movie about yeah. it recently. Um, I don't remember. Uh, yes. Remember the name, but like it... it The whole topic was about like two founders who did develop the concept, yeah. but had problems in scaling it. And one guy who just saw the concept and copied it and then uh, was successful with McDonald's rolling it out and uh, constructing McDonald's in a way. It's quite interesting to understand this dynamics. And it's also a question that came up for me from this. Is it like if you have a successful restaurant concept or a successful store concept, how helpful is it to have an owner operator in this space? Especially if you think about scaling it and running it like running from 10 scores to like 50, 100 scores, uh, stores, not scores. The, um, I mean, look, it, it's a really effective business model. Um, and you can franchise so many different kinds of things. So I think uh, you initially might think of stores or restaurants as a concept, you know, like a Subway, Subway um, sandwich shop. Uh, is a something that you can get into as a franchisee with a relatively low initial um, uh, outlay of cash. And a lot of times the, the parent will actually finance, help finance that initial outlay of cash to get you in there and open up the store because they believe that the concept will be successful. But, you know, I've seen um, battery and life... Uh, light bulb stores franchised. Um, I've seen real estate flipping businesses franchised, um, eyeglass businesses, uh, really any kind of thing that can be run on a local basis can be franchised. And 
uh, it's a very effective way to expand or scale, as you put it, quite quickly. Um, if you have enough infrastructure and you can monitor your franchisees, um, I, yeah, I think it's really attractive both as a public investor and in the private private um, space as well. I often heard when I talk to people in e-commerce and retail, retail is detail is a, is a quote they give me often. So how much love to detail is needed to run a restaurant or a retail business successfully? Um, it, it, it depends on the concept. Um, I think with restaurants, you know, cleanliness is very important. So you need to have a clean store. The, the kitchen needs to be clean. You've got health inspections. Um, you have a much higher standard. Uh, and the consumer isn't going to come back if they feel that the place that they're eating is not safe or clean, et cetera. That's not the true at all in some retail concepts. You can, and, and actually a funny thing that people may not be aware of is that in the discount store space, having a cluttered, messy store actually conveys value, which is to say, if you clean your store up too much, the consumer will actually perceive your, your prices are higher. So in a way, <laughs> there's an ironic benefit of being messy and disorganized if you're a value, you know, if you're trying to present to the value. Now, on the other hand, if you're Nordstrom or you're selling to a luxury customer, like you obviously can't get away with that. So, um, so that's my answer is it, it depends on the concept, um, but you know, it's important to know who your customer is and maintain store standards that are appropriate for, for, for that person. How like coming back to this in your way of analyzing companies, how do you look at consumer feedback, for instance, Google reviews or Yelp reviews, are they helpful to you or just like often biased at the moment? Because I've heard about some like Italian restaurant chains where everyone pays everyone out like to review <laughs> the other store badly that their store looks good and stuff like this. Well, that's very unethical. Um, so, it, so it's a good question. So I have spent uh, too much time uh, looking at reviews. Um, but what I find is that It's not that helpful. So uh, uh, if I use Lululemon as an example, again, you may recall several years ago, there was a, a debacle where they had some manufacturing issues for some of their pants, um, which caused the pants to, um, well, be see-through. Uh, and the um, founder uh, went on and made the comment that certain um, customers should not be wearing the pants because they were not, you know, appropriately sized. And that's why the pants were see-through because they were being stretched over too great of an area. So as you can imagine, this was, was a terrible, uh, thing. And, um, I'm putting it very politely here. And, uh, the, the, the sales went down, the customers were irate, et cetera. So at that time I spent a lot of time reading through the Google reviews and everyone was kind of talking about this. Um, but what I've come to, to uh, believe is that the online reviews are a forum for people who like to complain. So you have a bias to be complaining on those forums. Like it's if you go on there to complain. So it just if you as an analyst try to look at the, the Google reviews and try to understand them, it's going to I think it will be misleading. It's not a good it's not a good measurement. Um, it, you can't get. Um, a quantitative um, view of the business based on that. It might still be worth looking at now and then to just make sure that the, that a company is executing properly, but it, it's the noise level is very high. Like coming back to the idea of retail is detail, like how much detail do you need for your, like retail analysis is detail. <laughs> how much detail do you need for your analysis and How much do you like say it's more looking at the bigger picture? Um, you definitely need to understand, you know, how the co I find how the concept fits within the context of uh, the competitive set. Uh, and so I'm doing a little bit less of it now that I'm mostly based um, over here in Europe. But when I was in New York, I spent one 
a minimum of one day every month driving to stores. And so I would drive all around to stores in New Jersey, Connecticut, Long Island, um, upstate New York, and visit stores. In addition, every business trip I went on, I would allocate a half day or more to visit stores in local markets. So I visited stores in the Nashville, in Seattle, in San Francisco, in Denver, in Wisconsin, in Chicago, in Georgia, Florida, all over the whole country. Um, and the purpose of that was to review the store standards, see how the execution is at the store, um, take a look at inventory levels and promotional activity, and then also to view the stores relative to, to the competition. And so I think when you're trying to understand, you know, why is a concept working or not working, you do need to have a, a grasp of that qualitative component. Like, why is that business um, different? How is it positioned relative to the competition? Um, giving you an example, there's a retailer that I really like that's reporting earnings tonight. Actually, it's called Five Below. The ticker is five. Um, there's also a Russian food retailer with the name Five, not to be confused with, with this company. Um, and what Five sells are originally was $5 and less, but it sells discretionary items aimed at a kind of teenage to audience um, in a kind of a happy but cheaply constructed store. And where does this business fit within the context of its competitive set? So if you are a college student and you want to buy uh, some kind of decorations for your dorm room, um, your options might be Walmart and Target, where you know you're going to get cheapest, you know, a good price, but no teenager wants to shop in that environment. Um, or you could have a business like an Urban Outfitters or a Hot Topic where they have really cool things, but you're paying a significant premium to get those items. Five Below is selling fun, exciting product aimed for you at a value. And so what I found is that this concept, the, con the value plus the, the psychographic target of its customer, didn't really, they didn't really have competition for their model, what they were doing. And so they were providing solution and the stores have been very, very successful. They also are very good as merchants and building assortments and taking on, taking on top of trends. Um, and the store, the stock has been, uh, been a fantastic performer. So that, I think that's maybe the best example I can give you of why, why it is important or how I would take into account uh, kind of these qualitative um, or observational type details um, when I'm analyzing these businesses. Like what importance do you pay to your own gut feeling or your own taste when analyzing restaurants and retail shops? Or are you trying to be more like a kind of sociologist in this way or how you're balancing be between both views? Um, so another good question. I mean, I, I think that you need, you need to make sure you don't confuse your taste with the customer's taste. So whatever I might want to do or eat could be completely irrelevant to what many, many other people want to do or eat or buy. Um, so you have to be able to kind of separate your own personal um, aesthetic or, or tastes from, from your analysis. Um, so I, I think that's, that's important. Um, you know, there are certain clothing that I would never wear, but there are, you know, millions of people who would wear that clothing. And so that, you know, whether I like it or not is irrelevant. Good point. Um, you mentioned this approach of the unit level approach of figuring out the, the unit economics. Can you maybe walk us a bit through this approach? Uh, you're taking sure. It's a, it's a little bit technical, but let me see if I can kind of talk about it in a way uh, without referencing specific um, uh, spreadsheets, but maybe I can give you uh, some some uh, slides that you can put on on the talk to kind of overlay when I'm discussing it. I do have some presentations that go over it. Anyway, so 
the idea is that you can um, uh, isolate the sales, profit, and capital captured in cohorts of stores or restaurants or individual stores and restaurants, depending on how many there are. And when you're looking at a income statement for a restaurant or retail company, the first component is to separate out the expenses that aren't directly attributable to the stores. So I try to estimate, sometimes they break this out for you, but if not, I estimate how much are the corporate overhead costs? What's the GNA? Um, and in the case of retailers, I tend to remove distribution and transportation expenses. And so then uh, get to what is the store level margin. And so you can calculate what you think the cash flow per unit is. And then based on talking to the company, looking through the filings, um, presentations, you estimate the capital that's involved in each store and you calculate return on invested capital that way. That's the kind of the first level. Then you take that and you, you can do a peer group analysis where you compare what you think the box level return is to many other concepts. Uh, and then that tells you, is this a good concept or not? Because sometimes what happens is companies go public with tons of unit growth and Wall Street wants to assign a large uh, multiple to the stock because, hey, look, they can keep opening up these stores forever. But then when you do the actual analysis, you find out that the return metrics on the business are actually not attractive at all. They're just they're, so tons of stores with mediocre returns is not something you want to invest in. You certainly don't want to pay a high multiple for it. Um, and then the second piece is to do uh, a trend analysis. So we look at uh, on a linear basis, uh, are the return metrics of the box getting better or getting worse? And we try to understand what are the factors behind that? Sales productivity is increasing, expenses are rising faster than sales, are rents for the stores changing over time? And we generally wanna own companies that have a rising return on invested capital. And we wanna avoid those that have deteriorating return on invested capital. Uh, we also look at uh, cohorts of boxes. So we might say, okay, the company's average stores are excellent, but the stores they open over the last 12 months, if we isolate they, these, we can see that their returns are much, much worse. And we try to find out the reason for that. Uh, and what I would call that is return on incremental invested capital. And so what the kind of the best scenario from an investment standpoint is something where incremental invested capital is higher than the base capital. You just repeat that. So every incremental dollar or euro or pound that a company is putting into its business is generating a higher return than the existing business. When that happens, it means operating margins will be going up, overall return invested capital for the company will increase, Growth rate will normally accelerate. It correlates with all of these things. And you get a higher multiple for the stock because you get upward revisions to earnings relative to, to analyst estimates. Um, and of course, the opposite is true if, you're, if you have a deteriorating return on incremental invested capital. Let me give you two examples. When Chipotle went public, uh, it wasn't that well known, but they had some stores in New York City and where I was living at the time. And I noticed that people were willing to wait in line out the door to get to Chipotle. Well, there must be a hundred places to get lunch on every block in New York City. So I surmise that people must really believe there is a superior product there or they wouldn't wait in line like that. It's hot. They're wearing suits. Back in the day, people had to wear suits. Um, and um, when the company went public, and started opening up stores, the new store, like people, the brand, knowledge, knowledge of the brand was actually growing faster than the brand was growing itself. So over a five year period, each store set of stores it opened, opened at incrementally higher revenue levels. And so this was a very virtuous uh, scenario for the stock because the company was consistently beating analyst estimates. Margins were rising. 
growth was accelerating and th that just makes the stock do extremely well. The opposite is of the case is uh, at Shake Shack. Shake Shack went public with a small number of stores only located in the highest volume markets in America. So Times Square, Madison Square, New York City, um, Los Angeles, um, downtown Chicago. And they've been growing from those locations into suburban locations, smaller towns, et cetera. And so each incremental store year that they've opened has been a weaker uh, set of store metrics with lower revenues on a per box basis, lower margins and a reduced return on vested capital. And so that is a, a scenario that you want to avoid. So to kind of tie this together from an analysis analysis and approach standpoint, that's really the essence of the unit level uh, uh, approach is to, to find these trends and then understand the implications for this value of the company's stock um, based on following and understanding what's going on uh, beneath the surface. Uh, and that's, that's what I do. That's what I spend most of my day doing. If you do this, how important is also like the integration of digital services and uh, online services for the existing retailers and restaurants like what are good examples also like that companies really made it to integrate digital into their services so th the answer is it's super important but it also depends so in the case of the dollar stores not so important because it's a 12 dollar average ticket And the customer is buying uh, by average ticket. I mean, they're that's the average size of the items, number of items that they're buying in the store. Um, you know, it's not something you're going to have shipped to you. It's a convenience driven purchase at the last minute. Um, and so what their job is to do is to is to uh, get this pr product to the consumer at the lowest possible price so they can save money and buy it close to need. But Excluding that in some other cases, the answer is it's super important. Um, and uh, I generally attribute the revenues produced on the internet or e-commerce to the store, which may have been what you were um, kind of getting to. And so I'll give you an example. Um, during the pandemic, co two companies, Target and Dick Sporting Goods, um, had been investing in same day fulfillment for years. And because of uh, the pandemic, people wanted to get product without interacting with others, which is to say either have it shipped to them, but another option is buying it and getting it actually delivered to you in the parking lot. Walmart's also been developing something like this. They have what's called drive-through grocery. And you can find this in Europe too. But Walmart actually knocked out a wall onto uh, its stores. They created a, a staging area with refrigerators and then integrated their grocery inventory into the app. So the consumer could go on their app, you know, order what they wanted, and then drive up and never get out of the car And Walmart would come out and put the product directly into the trunk and they don't have to transact or whatever. And they just con continue driving to get home. Uh, the challenge with for Walmart is it's it's extremely difficult to to make money um, on this transaction, because previously, if you think about it, the customer was doing the fulfillment. Right. They walked through the store and picked all the merchandise. And now you have extra labor because you need someone to walk through the store pick up all those goods, stage it in the, fr in the fridge, time it correctly, and get it out into the store. But if we switch to uh, companies that have higher margin products like Dick's Sporting Goods or Target, the economics are different. And um, they were able to finally provide a, a real response that Amazon couldn't match because even though Amazon's getting a lot of things shipped to you same day, um, there are some inconveniences associated with getting products shipped to your home. You have an extra cart and you've got, you got to get rid of, uh, what if it's the wrong size, you have to send it back. That's not always so easy. Um, 
when you buy something online and you pick it up in the parking lot on the same day, you can immediately verify that it is what you ordered. You can try it on right there in the parking lot if it's apparel uh, and then exchange it right at that moment without having to drive to the post office. Um, and then the customer would typically come in and get add-ons potentially when they got less concerned about um, COVID. And the all of these capabilities were enabled by this multiple years of investment in technology and knowing where their inventory was and integrating their apps into what's in the store and then having the, the um, store employees be able to fill those orders. Just as a, a last addendum, um, Target, which also operates a uh, franchised Starbucks in nearly all of its stores, is trying to integrate its uh, online ordering so that when you arrive at the store, you can also have your custom made Starbucks coffee beverage brought out to you at exactly the same moment. Now, think about the logistical challenge of doing that, right? So picking a bunch of diapers and laundry detergent and apparel or whatever and putting that in the bag, that's one thing. But to get the coffee beverage just the way you want it so it's still hot at the moment that you arrive is another level of precision. And that's amazing. It's definitely something that Amazon can't do for you. And uh, it eliminates the need to do a second shopping trip or a second trip if you're that customer. So technology and omni-channel, these things are super important. They're kind of, they're definitely table stakes uh, and the companies that can execute well are, are definitely winning. Digitization is definitely a super interesting topic but for the end uh, of our great interview i want to discuss two names in more details it's luck and coffee and lululemon um let's start with luck and coffee uh, you've recommended it as an investment but it was a fraud like what happened there hey tillman here i'm sure you're curious about the answer to this question But this answer is exclusive to the members of my community, Good Investing Plus. Good Investing Plus is a place where we help each other to get better as investors day by day. If you are an ambitious, long-term oriented investor that likes to share, please apply for Good Investing Plus. Just go to good-investing.net slash plus. You can also find this link in the show notes. I'm waiting for your application. And without further ado, let's go back to the conversation. So if anyone wants to discuss more details on Luckin' Coffee, the, the person can reach out to you. Your details are below. I will link your website below. And uh, now let's take a look at Lululemon. I think it's a bit more known name. Uh, yeah, but sure. it's not like... <laughs> I honestly had not... Personally, I had no touch points with them. So um, maybe you can tell a bit about the background, especially for the European listeners who hasn't had that many touch points with, with them. What do they do besides recommending uh, that some of their yoga pants shouldn't be wet by everyone or worn by everyone? <laughs> that was the past. That, that was the past. Um, the, I believe they do have some stores in Germany. I'm not sure how many. I'm not sure if there's one in Stuttgart. I, uh, I have to, to go to it today. <laughs> I've already planned it. Okay. okay, excellent. Okay, well, good. Visit the store. Which, this is important. Um, uh, so essentially, they understood that um, women uh, were looking for very high quality um, athletic apparel to wear it, uh, in their activities. And... The alternative, which was, you know, Nike product or Adidas or some of these other athletic brands, uh, I think at the time was more produced with a mass customer in mind. So it's a premium product, but not ultra premium. So old, old, uh, Lululemon came in with very high quality, well-designed, fashionable product and um, really captured the consumer's uh, interest. They also at the stores tried to integrate themselves into the local community um, and they aligned their brand with a lot of things that uh, women in particular uh, felt um, uh, very strongly about. 
And uh, so they took share uh, by having great product with with very strong service and small stores in um, a uh, branded environment or with values that the consumer cared about. Now, over the last 10 years, they've tried to expand more into men's, which I think is maybe a quarter of the business now. So it's it's less female only than it, it once was. And men seem to have adopted the brand, even though I was a bit skeptical that that would happen initially, given what I've already mentioned about the, the kind of female focus. Um, but they've been really great at building assortments uh, and continuing to excite the customer with new cuts and new apparel, uh, sorry, new fabrications uh, and new color schemes uh, and get the customer to, to continue to buy more. Simultaneously, there have been secular trends in the company's favor around um, casualization. Uh, so that is not wearing as much formal clothing, comfort, uh, their, co their clothes tend to be very comfortable um, and um, being healthy. So you need to have um, athletic apparel and footwear that to, to wear during your activities. Um, one anecdote, uh, which I'll share, um, it, you may remember, or you know, of Under Armour, which is not a company that I follow that carefully today, but I used to follow. Um, when I was, I'm, I'm a fairly active person and I like to, to, to run and I used to run, you know, after graduation from college at that time, you just wore whatever dirty old t-shirt you had lying around when you ran. And then you threw that in the wash and never thought anything about it. But then when Under Armour came along, they um, took a material, which granted was very old, called polyester, and started talking about its um, moisture wicking and cooling properties relative to cotton. And then that became something that people needed to wear to, to do their exercise. And I started to feel, even though I personally didn't care, that if I weren't wearing some kind of fancy fabric, that I was just not a serious runner at all. Now, why why would you feel this way? Because fashion influences you, whether you like it or not, whether you're trying to have it influence you or not. And um, and so Lululemon and Under Armour and Nike, they just upgraded the entire athletic spectrum in terms of what people were willing to pay for and what their expectations were for the performance of the a product and apparel that they that they are wearing. And so Lululemon is now trying to replicate this success in other markets outside the US while still growing in the US. So the open stores in the UK, um, uh, in other European countries and in Asia. And I think they have not been able to replicate that in, for example, France, um, somewhat in UK, but where they have done well is in China, Singapore, or some of these Asian markets where they've seen a, a strong demand for their, for their product, um, which is in, which is interesting um, in my mind. But uh, it's, it's super powerful from a financial standpoint. The margins are really high. It's all vertical. They only sell their own brand. They don't wholesale it except in very small amounts. And so you've got a very profitable business that's quite large and growing quite fast in a global basis. And so the market um, is assigning a very high multiple to the stock for these characteristics. And do you think they can still grow in the future so that the multiple is justified? So certainly you're, you're taking more risk, right? Whenever you pay a big multiple, and I think they may be trading at four times revenues, um, but it's probably a 25% EBIT margin business, uh, you know, which is just to say that every dollar of revenue they produce at 25 cents is profit. Um, and they're buying, you know, set, uh, spinning off quite a lot of excess cash as well. Um, so, the, and the answer is they have been growing. Um, I do think they can keep growing. Um, you know, they crushed the uh, guidance or their objectives over the last three years. So they had to up update it and put even more ambitious targets out there. You know, if they do not achieve those as an investor, you're going to get really hurt in the stock because earnings could still grow, but the multiple in the stock will contract quite substantially. So this is a growth stock. This is not a value stock. Um, 
This is, is, is a name that um, has considerable risks from an execution and multiple standpoint, but you know they've been able to do it. And um, so far, it's been a smart bet to, to bet on them. Then thank you very much for the insights into Lululemon as well and in Luck and Coffee. Um, for the end of our conversation, is there anything you want to add people should consider when thinking about uh, retail and restaurant investments? Um, I mean, the, the thing, you know, we look for are new concepts, um, new brands that you can buy when they're still small at, um, at and hopefully at a reasonable multiple. So I think, you know, if, if you're an investor, you're an individual investor and you're looking at the space, you, you should use your own experience. You should say, hey, where do I like to shop? Um, you know, why is this concept good? Uh, and and then you, know, you can use that as a uh as an edge, uh, you know, as a legitimate edge to think about the business from an investment standpoint, um, then do, you know, the rest of the real work that you need to do. But that, that is a, a legitimate way in my view to, to start from a, from a, from a stock selection standpoint. Then thank you very much for our great conversation. And thanks for having me. It's been great. And thank for the audience staying till here. Bye bye. As in every video, also here is the disclaimer. You can find the link to the disclaimer below in the show notes. The disclaimer says, always do your own work. What we're doing here is no recommendation and no advice. So please always do your own work. Thank you very much.